Product Stacks is brought to you by Storyblock, one of the world's fastest growing headless CMSs. A headless CMS like Storyblock separates the back end from the front end. By moving to an API based CMS like Storyblock, you can publish your content to any front end, whether that's your marketing website or directly inside your product. Developers love Storyblock because they can use it with any front end framework they prefer and create components that can be reused anywhere as content blocks, cutting development time in half. Content teams are excited about the discussions feature built directly into Storyblock's visual editor. No more Slack or email threads to discuss content changes. Join 86,000 developers plus companies like Harvard Business School, Adidas, Netflix, Oatly, and Pizza Hut who all use Storyblock by trying a free demo at storyblock.com slash department of product. Go to storyblock.com slash department of product. That's Storyblock with a K at the end slash department of product. So joining us today is Aishwarya from Amazon and Aishwarya is a principal product manager at Amazon. So thanks very much Aishwarya for taking some time out of your day to, to speak to us and to share your, your product stack with, with the community. Uh, so we kick off with a bit of a, an introduction, a bit about your background. Yeah, sure thing. Hey everybody, like Richard said, I'm Aishwarya Murli. I'm currently a principal product manager at Amazon. I work on the other side of the marketplace in Amazon. So you know how customers buy products on Amazon.com. Sellers, vendors and brands sell on sellerscentral.com. And we have both, as you can imagine, like a desktop experience as well as an app. <clears throat> and every time that they you know, perform a selling activity on one of these websites and they feel like they need help and they need to reach out to support, my team owns the products through which they're able to do that. And so basically it's all of the front end and the back end experiences that identify what the seller's issue might be, how we might be able to help them through self-service or get them to the right person who can resolve their issue as soon as possible. That's what I do today. Uh, but I have about uh, 10 years in my back uh, on experience here. I've uh, been through a variety of roles, uh, supply chain engineering, procurement, sustainability, if you'll believe it, and now product management. I worked in <clears throat> Deloitte. That was the start of my career. I did procurement and sustainability at Dell right after my uh, MBA. And then I went and worked at Expedia, where I was a product manager, and then today at Amazon. Education-wise, I have an undergrad in computer science and engineering from very long ago. I can't write code anymore to save my life, but uh, just having a good understanding of how that foundation works has helped. And then I have an MBA in operations and supply chain management. So Kind of together, you can see how they worked towards all these companies that I worked for and into product management, just the engineering focus and with supply chain and operations, just the idea of scale kind of helps me uh, be good at my job. So that's me. Perfect. Thanks very much for, for sharing some information about your background. And I think s supply chains and logistics is one of those areas that if you've never worked in it, you just don't fully appreciate how complex it can be. It's almost like a unique world of, of product management in itself because you're dealing with both the digital experience and then also the, the physical experience. And are there mm -hmm. things that you, what are the things that you like about product and what are the things perhaps you found quite challenging, would you say? Yeah, for sure. Actually, you know, I feel like even though it sounds like operations, supply chain, logistics and procurement, all of that stuff, like it's so different from product management. I've actually found not. In fact, it was my supply chain and procurement background that got me interested in product management at all. Specifically, you know, like when when you're planning factory floors and, you know, like when you're trying to calculate your throughput for a facility, et cetera, you know, you know, one thing which is how really small changes can have very big impacts right. and you know to be able to scale those with tech which is what product allows you to do is one of the things that you know just drew me to the impact of making small changes so yeah before we, we get into your into your product stack what we've been asking folks to do who've been taking part is just to give us a flavor of their overall product process so let's start off with with a you know an overview of how you do roadmap and strategy yeah, for sure. So I think the first thing is just, you know, not to be daunted by the word strategy, you know, just, just so that like all listeners know strategy is something that should be open to change. That's the whole point of setting a strategy, which where, you know, you are open to learning and unlearning and changing uh, routes. And so it's not really like, you know, set something at the beginning of the year and then you can never touch it. So just given that, you know, whatever, what the process that I use and I encourage my team to use is just to be more iterative and flexible with it. But some things are at the at the heart of setting the right roadmap and strategy so that regardless of you know which path you have to take you're grounded in certain truths and that's the most important and that's where like i'd say that you know this whole process begins 
<clears throat> I, I recommend that, you know, folks ground yourself in the customer problem that you are trying to solve. And a lot of, you know, a lot of my learnings have come from, you know, being at Expedia and more often, more recently on, in the three years, you know, might be speaking Amazon quite a bit. So I'll hold you account, uh, Richard, to hold me accountable for it. Uh, but really just understanding your customer problem is the most important thing. If you spend any time at all during the year setting a roadmap and strategy, this is the one that you should spend most time on. So if you understand like, you know, what your broader company or your product is trying to do and where those real customer problems are on the, on the journey that, you know, looks like a happy path that your company or your product has designed for this customer, you'll quickly understand like where do you fall in this problem space. And so understanding the broader customer problem, as well as the one where your product is trying to solve are the two most important things to get started on a roadmap and strategy. Once you've put a flag in the ground on that, I would then understand how your company measures goals of success failure around this customer problem or this customer journey. Similarly, you'll have to do this at two levels. One at the company's level, which more you know, typically look like output metrics, which could be revenue, it could be a cost, it could be anything, depending on what kind of function you're working for. And then come in a little bit deeper and double click into what your product is trying to solve and how you measure those metrics. Now, those metrics are going to look a whole lot like input metrics, which typically are you know, highly correlated to your output metric. So for example, if it's revenue and your team owns the checkout product or the cart product, you know, it could be like number of items in a cart, now time spent on the cart, things like that. Okay. Typically like engagement related metrics that fuel the funnel towards an actual purchase, which then is your output of revenue. So understanding those two suites of metrics is really important so that you know, you know, how your product is trying to solve a broader problem and how it is measured as compared to the company's measurements. Yeah. So in, in, in Amazon, is it that the company will have its overall kind of vision and business strategy? And then mm -hmm. as you were saying, there's like a, a more granular strategy, which is done on a per, is it on a, but is, is that done on, on a per product basis or would that be done? Uh, for each individual team, like how how granular does that roadmap, does that separate roadmap uh, and strategy get set versus the you know the overall vision vision and business strategy? Um, so for us, I think you know we do it at all levels. We do it at the company level. We do it at the organization level. Like I'm in selling partner support, so it means you know support has certain goals for a year. I do it at a portfolio level for okay. all the products that my team owns and my individual. Uh, product managers do it for their individual product so every time you know you're hooked into just the level above to make sure that the story ties together is the most important thing I don't think you know strategies and roadmaps are limited to very big or very small kind of products they it's just good product management to do it regardless so that you know you always know what's next and why it's next that's just the core of having a roadmap so I'd encourage it at all levels Perfect. Thanks very much. And one one of the things that comes up sometimes from our from our uh, community is their product manager. They've been asked to put together a strategy and roadmap, but they're not sure that that the business, like the business and the the C level, haven't developed a business strategy. But I wonder if you've got any advice or any experience with that particular problem as well. Yeah, you know, if if you're in this situation, I recommend not waiting on someone to tell you what the broader strategy is. You know, ultimately, you know, all of all of the products with within a certain like umbrella or something like they all work towards something. And I feel like product managers, regardless of your tenure, the size of your product, you know, wherever you might be in this hierarchy, um, you should feel uh, empowered in order to stand back and look at the big picture and paint that picture if it hasn't been painted yet. And, you you know, there's only uh, two things that can happen from it, right? Like you go to like the, the broader business and you're like, hey, this is what I think the picture should be. And only two things can happen. One is like, oh, we've never thought about it this way. Let's think about it this way. Or it could be actually we've been thinking about it and I, I think we want to head in a different direction. Either way, you get the result that you wanted, which is where are you headed? And whether, you know, you bring those data points to the table or the discussion leads itself to, you know, pivoting because of what you brought, you've got the insight you required. So you, sh you should always feel empowered to go to the table with something you think you should do. Perfect. Should we, should we move on to your, onto your yeah. team setup then? I think in terms of team setup, I like, you know, I've, like you might imagine, it depends by company, depends by the actual team, your 
product, for example, you know, if you own, let's say like a machine learning product, your setup is going to be very different versus let's say if you own front end. So I've taken a broad swap of, you know, kind of the core functionalities that you would expect. So as you can imagine, it's the usual haunts. You know, we have a product manager, we have a UX team who helps you, you know, build kind of, you know, what the experience is going to look like in terms of like wireframes, user research, prototyping, etc. The analyst who helps you figure out like data, make sure you're measuring the right things if it can be actually measured. And more importantly, the product manager and the analyst together help construct a sound A-B test so that you can actually find statistical significant results, etc. And so... So we have those functions and typically product UX and analytics are a part of phase one, which is, you know, like, hey, there's this thing that we want to do. Here's why we want to do it. And here's how we want to do it. And so that's, I would think like is phase one. And phase two is basically, you know, where we've locked everything down. We've got our initial, you know, feelers back from like your actual customers through like research or something uh, because of the prototype. And then we hand it over to the second phase, which is actually development, which is our, you know, engineering team led by an SDM more often than not. And then we have our SDEs who could be a collection of anything like front end back and, you know, whatever it might be. And we hand over to them what we think we want to do. Of course, we're always, you know, agile in, in our expectations. So at this point, you know, we only bring to tech something we think that will be helpful to a customer because of some sort of research or prototyping that we've done. And then when we come over to tech, you know, we hear about like what's possible from a tech feasibility, what are some haircuts we could make, etc. And then at the end, and so this is phase two, like the act feasibility of launching this and then comes phase three which is more you know where all of these functions sit together and figure out what could be the skinniest mvp that we can launch for this decision you need all parties on the table and that's kind of where phase three ends as okay we know exactly what we want we know why we want it we know how less we can do in order to prove a hypothesis or not now let's get cracking on development so that's kind of how our team setup is Okay, perfect. And is is does SDM and SDE is that is that software development manager and software manager engineer, and engineers? Well? That's right. Yeah, an engineer. Perfect. And how many yeah. engineers roughly would you have in a in a typical team like this? It it honestly depends on the funding of your products, and so. So typically it's very different from like other companies that I've worked at, but Amazon is pretty cool this way, you know, like at the end of every uh, year for the next year, we do some round of planning where we look at the biggest problems that are still out there, how they impact our metrics and, you know, figure out like, what do we want to change about this experience in the next year? They get scoped out and then we just do a broad swap ROI across all our, you know, all of our like funding requests. And then it's a just, you know, we cut a line and say, okay, here's where the ROI goes below the line for us. And then you're awarded those resources. Perfect. And is there, so sometimes what we've seen is like in a, in a squad setup or in like a pod setup or whatever we want to describe it, cross-functional team setup, um, mm-hmm. sometimes they can be so engrossed in their own goals and their own processes, particularly in a, in a remote setup that they almost forget to speak to other squads. And sometimes, you know, you that might end up uh, negatively impacting the overall product experience because sometimes you'd have one product, but then separate teams have worked on it and the overall experience can can suffer. You know, like when you see like, oh, well, clearly that bit's been built by some team. They haven't spoken to this <laughs> yeah. team. <laughs> so, you know, I was wondering, do, do you or does Amazon broadly have anything in any anything in place which ensures that collaboration between the, the squads, between the teams to, you know, to ensure that there is a, a coherent experience? Yeah, <clears throat> honestly, there's no silver bullet, but I can tell you what, our team doesn't have found helpful so amazon is big on just you know like failing fast that's really at the heart of everything that we do all of our decisions our mechanisms all of those are driven on those so we actually in order to test an mvp we don't hold ourselves back from from needing to align with everybody and figure everything out because uh, amazon is a big company and it can be really hard you know it can take you months just to get to an alignment So we don't slow anybody down when we want to test an hypothesis. How before we dial it up, you know, let's say that we actually prove the hypothesis. It did improve our success metrics and all of that. And, you know, between a control and a treatment environment, your treatment won. Now, in order for that to become the control experience, that's where we stop you. To say, okay, you've proved your hypothesis. Now, if it needs to be visible to every single customer every single day, 
you now need to align with a bunch of folks and you need to build this in a scalable way. So that way, you know, we don't spend a lot of time aligning on things that may or may not work. We only spend good time sitting down and thinking about aligning on the things that absolutely did work and we have the data to prove it. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Perfect. And yeah, and then finally, before you move into your into your product stacks, the your product process. So with teams like this, what what is your typical software development process? How do you actually then move into the build phase? What does that look like? Are you doing like sprints? Are you doing Kanban or is it something else? We do sprints um, right now. I have done Kanban before. I'm a big fan of Kanban, but it I I think it works in companies that are smaller. And, you know, so I think that's a lot of fun. Like just like the, just like the, what's the most important thing for all of us to work on today. It can be real fun and you feel really involved in this. But sprints, although I rejected it in the beginning, I'm starting to understand why it's so important for a company of this size and this impact. You know, we need to be, we need to be in sync and things can't happen fast. And there's never one most important thing to work on. Like when you work on like a scale of things that is, Amazon. And so our team currently works on two week sprints just because, you know, it's just the, it's a sizable amount of time that a, that an engineer can spend and actually feel like they moved, you know, to progress state on something. And so we found that that helps. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, we've we've had similar. We in our in our surveys that we've sent out, it's, it's typically the the smaller companies who are running Kanban and the large companies yeah. who are running sprints. Uh, but two week sprints and Scrum is is by far the most popular. But yeah, in in my experience as well, I've always I, when I've worked in smaller startups, we've always adopted a Kanban approach, and it is yeah. it is it is a lot of fun to be able to just look at the board and be like, actually, should we do that today or should we not? You can ch- chop and change direction quite regularly. But in a, as yep. you were saying, now in a, in a big company. Uh, scrum and sprints gives you that predictability that I think a lot of larger companies just would rather have. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah perfect. Thanks, thanks very much for for sharing that. So, so with yeah. that, with with a, with a bit of a, the context set, shall we shall we take a look at some of the products that you've chosen uh, in your product stack? For sure. So I have three that I want to talk about today, and I chose some that actually don't have anything to do with actual technology that you're going to that you'll be tied to if you need to be if you need to use one of these and so instead you know I thought I'd share with you the things that I that I started with as a product manager and I still do to this day so I could say that they you know they've stayed relevant with me regardless Uh, and so I'm going to start with the first one which is an insights board this is just you know a view into Aishwarya's brain honestly uh, a place where you know you can organize all of your insights, your findings, things like data and anecdote. It could be anything, but it's one place where, you know, you can just go and put it. You can think about it as like very organized sticky notes, but it's all organized by a, the customer journey or a customer problem that you're responsible for. And for this one, I would highly encourage that you look beyond just your product. You know, like you look at the customer journey end to end or whatever you have previewed to. A good example could be, you know, let's say that you own a typical like, you know, login to check out kind of e-retail website. You know, if you own just the, let's say the the product detail page or the search function within that product, I would highly encourage you to still map out and create an insights board, however empty or full, for all those pages so that it's every single part of the customer journey. And it's important because when you go back and you look at these insights, you can't look at them in isolation. You need to look up, look at it like, oh, but you know, before this, you, I've asked you to do 50,000 things like in terms of filters and whatever. And then I'm asking you to, you know, filter again on the search results page. And when you start looking at like, oh, why are people complaining about having to filter all the time? You can only see that if you have a view into the entire end-to-end customer journey. So what I like to do is this is the one place where I am. I'm organized about the customer journey, but not at all about the way that, you know, I actually keep a record of my findings. So some things that I would say, you know, definitely add anecdotes, like whether you hear them from, whether they come back verbatim from some sort of survey that, you know, your team monitors, it could be from a UX research, it can be from a prototype study that your team was doing, it can be from somebody else's documents, you know, add data or results from Previous launches like A-B tests, you know, whether you were able to prove this hypothesis or disprove this hypothesis, 
And I put this one on here. Uh, we are, at Amazon, we're not big fans of customer uh, competitive studies, but you know, I have seen this at other companies and I think it can be useful for inspiration. So I'd like to show you an example of kind of, you know, what that might look like. For example, if this is the landing page, homepage, you know, I, I just, I color code things because I can see, you know, this is like an anecdote of somebody who said something's crowded. And then, you know, this is a positive one that uh, says that, you know, they liked it because they use this particular mo module frequently. And then I just, you know, have a place where I can throw proven hypothesis, you know, what's the widget engagement rate on this page and things like that, that I can always come back to. And I found more often than not, honestly, you know, over like, over a couple of months of getting used to having a board where you can go through stuff on. Sometimes like I spend, I dedicate like an hour or something in like, you know, every two months to just stare at the screen and just look at these things and see how the story comes out to me. And that really helps me understand you know, what all the seller, uh, I mean, sorry, what all the customer might be going through or how they feel at, in a totality, like in a 50 foot view and try to find the connections between these very disparate data points. And so that I, I really found that that's helpful. Yeah, this is a, this is a really neat idea. And do you have any tips on someone who, if, if people, if folks are thinking about adopting this approach, do you have any yeah. tips on how you, you know, some of the questions you might need to ask yourself in order to generate some, like you've got little widgets there of information, you've got the engagement rate and examples of, you know, quotes, what, what thought process do you have to go through to, to think about, you know, what are the most important things I should be adding to my insights board? You know, how do you prioritize what to include on them? For me, I make sure that I have the two, two really important things. One are anecdotes. Okay. That helps me, uh, you know, just verbatim from customers who use your product is really insightful. And it's, it's oftentimes those things that don't show up on the metrics. For example, you know, you could just look at this widget engagement rate and you're like, oh, it's 15% maybe, but I don't know why. And when you, when you dig down into, I don't know why these anecdotes could tell you things that we don't, that are very difficult to measure in like, you know, like product metrics, like engagement rate and things like that. So oftentimes I found that, you know, be, be really present in the moment when you are in a UX research study on sign up to be in everybody's UX research studies, especially the beginning of a career, you never know what you might find. You get a really rich perspective of what the customer is doing on the page just before yours you know, how happy they were, what were their expectations when they came to your page, how far along, you know, how much effort had they already put in at this point before they came to your page, et cetera, and what they do after to see how you can make that transition more smooth for them. And so I would say, you know, just <clears throat> definitely start with throwing anecdotes in there. I think it really helps ground you in how the customer feels. That, and that's one thing that's very hard to measure anywhere else. <clears throat> Apart from that, you know, I know that, Amazon presents, we present our metrics weekly. Um, we present our metrics monthly and quarterly. <clears throat> and so for your team, um, you know, whatever that cadence might be in your company, I'd encourage you to, you know, go and add that in there. Like, you know, once you're reporting it either at a monthly level or a quarterly, it also depends on the kind of product you own. <clears throat> if they don't change on a weekly basis, it's probably not required. But, you know, like if you go at a monthly stage, maybe it helps to just be like, hey, month over month, this thing has been going up or down. And then you'll start to see the trends in those. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Is, is this something that you ask each of your individual product teams to, to put together? And then... Or, or is it, or is it, is it up to, is it up to each team to decide whether they, you know, do this or something else? Or? It's, it's up to everybody, you know, what they want to do. I highly encourage this because I've seen that it helps me. And over time, you know, our plan is to have one of these where any one of us can go and throw in data and numbers and screenshots and things like that. And, and so we have one place where we can all go and just look at, you know, before a hackathon or something, yeah. I know that I find myself coming here and just be like, oh, which would, what, which of these would be a crazy thing to do in a hackathon. And so I found these super helpful. Perfect. Yeah, that's that's really interesting, actually. And I, I imagine that complements your roadmap and your strategy quite nicely as well. So if you're Absolutely. if you're presenting your roadmap, presenting what you what you're building and why, then you can use your insights board to to justify some of the investment decisions as well. Hundred percent. And I've also, you know, like I mentioned early on in this call, like the roadmap and strategy is not a beginning of the year thing. You do it and you lock it away. This again just shows, you know, like if you see something different than what you thought was true on Jan first, it's completely okay. You know, being open to uh, to learning along the way and iterating just based on the data and anecdotes you have. 
uh, is really important. And I feel like this mechanism helps me stay grounded. So I don't have some sort of like confirmation bias, you know, like, hey, don't, I fix this strategy and I'm going to get it done no matter yeah. what. And so, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. That's, re- that's really interesting. Yeah. Shall, we, shall we move on to, your, to the second uh, item that you've chosen as part of your product stack? For sure. So I'm going to be super brief on this one because I'd like to spend more time on the third one, especially since, you know, I had a chance to watch uh, Kristen from Shopify's video. I know she was from Amazon too. So you can't speak to any of us without uh, (laughs) us mentioning a PR FAQ. So I'm glad she did it before me. But uh, this is a a kind of like a vision document. I think it's really important, you know, regardless, even if you own the tiniest little button on a page, it's important to have this just, you know, to allow yourself to think big and work backwards from your customer. Okay. This has been um, stolen so many times now by other companies. Everyone's, yeah. doing, everyone's <laughs> stolen it from Amazon. Uh, so Absolutely. <laughs> it is, it's a really great tool in order for, but, but do you should do it right. So yeah. even if you do steal it, you should do it right. And so, you know, I think Christian does a great example of explaining, you know, what it's for and, and, you know, how to do it well. And so I'll be really brief on that. And I'll just touch on a couple of really important things to keep in mind in addition to what Christian said so that, you know, you can make sure you have a great PR FAQ. The first one is, you know, if Vision doc is typically for something that's a step change in an experience. Okay, so if you find yourself like making an incremental change or a bunch of incremental change, this is probably not the right tool for you. However, I think it is a great thought exercise for every product manager to, you know, in the beginning of the year, write about what the end of the year will feel like. Okay, and I want to stress on the word feel like instead of the words looks like. Because when you when you describe the experience uh, from what it's going to look like, it breaks one of my fundamental tenets as a uh, product manager, which is you have decided on what the UX is going to look like without leaving any room to learn an iterate or test hypothesis, etc. And so if you feel like, you know, regardless of what that UX looked like, you know, you would still be able to, uh, an actual customer would be able to describe their experience, the, the way they feel about that experience. So using words like, hey, it's going to be quick or it's going to be effortless for you to do this rather than like, as soon as you land on the page, you will see these things that are personalized, in boxes, you know that you know. Then you're headed down a rabbit hole about what it looks like. Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a really nice perspective, actually, a really nice way of framing it. And we were speaking to somebody, I can't remember which company it was from now, but they were saying similarly. They like to mm-hmm. include the you know the feelings that a customer will have when they're when they're using your product. And I, I hadn't really. I mean, I know it's part of the jobs to be done framework a lot of the times, but yeah, you make a really, it's a really good point there. I think, isn't it? As opposed to jumping to straight to solutions and thinking about how it visually looks. Uh, orienting it around feelings is probably way more more powerful. 100%. And it also keeps you true to what you wanted to achieve, yeah. which is which is truly from like, you know, if you follow the process of like, hey, I have an insights board and, you know, this person felt overwhelmed when they came on this page, then I might describe my vision as like, hey, when someone clicks on, when someone lands on this page, like, you know, they they see exactly what they need. They are not overwhelmed because we are relevant. And, you know, that kind of stuff, like it keeps you steady on your vision and lose on the details, which is honestly the flexibility that you need. And it's also important to feel grounded in like, when I end this year, did I, is this going to make them feel crowded? Is this going to be effortless? Is it going to be obvious? Are the questions you should ask yourself rather than like, you know, is it two boxes or is it three? There is a time for those questions and that will come in the, in the next product too. But just before we end this one, what, you know, just a, one last caveat here. These are also typically multi-year. I think it's a great practice to do it yearly. A year can go by pretty quick if you if you don't keep tabs on it. And so I highly encourage, you know, start getting used to like, hey, the end of the year state, like what will this feel like is really important to get into the uh, groove of doing regardless. But these become, uh, it's a nice to have when you're looking at like a one year, but When you're looking uh, multi-year, you know, like things that actually take step changes often take time, not only to launch, but to convert a customer behavior can also take time. And so, you know, these are typically used for more multi-year projects, you know, just keep that in mind, but it shouldn't stop you from trying for the one year anyway, just get in the practice. 
Perfect. Yeah. Thank, thanks very much for, you know, having, sharing your own personal perspective on that. I know you mentioned that, yes, Kristen uh, did went, go, went into that in detail. So it's really interesting to see, uh, you know, someone who's still at Amazon share their unique perspective on it. And I think, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Thanks very much. Sure. So with that, should we, should we move on to the final part of your, of your product, yeah. stuff, what you've chosen? Absolutely. This one is my absolute favorite. It is an experiment document. I am a, I am a firm believer that, you know, constructing good A-B tests is really the differentiator between, you know, launching a good experience and launching one that made a difference. And so, uh, you know, keeping that in mind, you know, an experiment document are all of, unlike the vision document is the every single launch that you going to launch. It's about, you know, starting small, you test, you iterate, and this is really the, the how you build towards, you know, your vision document, whatever it described as what it should feel like. A collection of your experiment documents are what they start to look like. And this is the place to start thinking about what, you know, the experience actually is going to look like. And so, you know, I'll show you an example like of a structure that our team uses in order to make sure that, you know, we construct the right experiment for an, for any sort of improvement in an experience. But uh, typically, you know, this is not rocket science. I mean, what problem are you trying to solve? Again, you know, like these are the kinds of uh, questions that you will start, you will never run out of. Like what are the problems you're trying to solve? If you have something like an insights board that is a constant pipeline of things you need to solve. <clears throat> and then, you know, what is your hypothesis with this? You know, this is basically like your null hypothesis. What is it that you want to change? Why do you think it's going to change? And I'll show you an example of how uh, to construct a sound hypothesis. And then what is your solution? Um, like what's the MVP, like stripped down version of the solution that you would love to launch, but it's more important to prove a hypothesis versus whether it was true, whether it did no harm with statistical significance before you go down that route and invest your, you know, SDE resources in them. And then what is your customer experience? This is more just, you know, like uh, it could be a flow diagram. It can be UX mocks. It could be a prototype. It could be a video demo. It could be anything, but it explains what is going to be the step-by-step -step kind of experience for the customer in your new environment versus the old. And then most importantly, how will you measure you solve your customer problem? This ties directly into the hypothesis, you know, like what are your success metrics? Like if you are trying to improve engagement, then it's probably going to be click through rate. If you're trying to improve satisfaction, you know, it's probably going to be something that measures it through a survey, implicit, explicit, whatever your team uses, et cetera. So it's important to think through those. And then finally, we develop and launch. So I'm going to show you an example of how um, our team does this. And we follow the exact same format. And I just created an example here that, you know, folks can feel free to copy and use as their own. So like I said, you know, the highlights of this is we have a customer problem, a hypothesis, a solution, mocks, the A-B test design, and your success metrics. In the customer problem, it's typically like, you know, today customers find X difficult to perform. This is probably like a jobs to be done that your, that your team has identified for this customer because of why. In a customer interview, customer A said, something in quotes, like you have an anecdote to go along with this that helps people understand how the seller feels. This anecdote is then also supported by data, you know, to say that the job, whatever your jobs to be done was the success rate or the failure rate is X percent or Y percent. So, you know, marrying those anecdotes and data is super important just so that folks can, not just folks, you as well, you know, what is your opportunity size, you know, just because one person says something that doesn't mean we go down to prove an hypothesis, like we have to marry them together. and. And yeah, and so basically like this helps you understand like what, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Why do we think it's a problem? How big of a problem is it is all covered in the customer problem section? Okay, perfect. And who, who, would, be, who would be involved in, in creating a, a document like this? Is it something that's typically just done with the PM or is it cross-functional? Like how, how does this do document get, get created? Yeah, uh, great question, Richard. Most of this is the product manager's job. Okay. okay. However, a product manager job is unique in that you're usually the one who gets all who gets the party started, but then you need folks along the way uh, to help pitch in. And so 
I would think, you know, from my experience, the customer problem, the hypothesis, the success metrics and other things here, you know, I'll explain as we go. Most of this about, you know, 70% is I think a PM's job. And the remaining is obviously like a collaboration with our tech, with analytics, et cetera. So, you know, it's just, it, it, they contribute to different parts of this experiment dog, but I think the champion is the product manager. Perfect. And, and who would be the audience for this document? Ah, at Amazon, everybody is an audience for a document uh, because <laughs> okay. we love reading and reviewing documents. Okay. But it, it's a really rich way for somebody to give you an outside perspective of something you're so deep in the weeds of being that, you know, you might have made a leap in faith in a hypothesis or some, uh, you don't know how it's going to impact something else. And so it could be really useful. However, the ultimate, you know, uh, source of truth for, uh, for any tech design is this document. Right. Okay. okay. And we also find apart from tech, like once we actually launch something and we, we, we need to find a way to be able to document what we learned, what did it produce? Yeah. And so this document then ends up being a living document that begins with the idea and ends when it's either been dialed down or dialed up and it contains all the information within it. And would you, so you, after something has launched uh, and you've then got data, which proves or disproves the hypothesis, do you then come back yeah. to the document, update it and share those learnings as well? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. And, and you were saying that, you know, everyone reads documents at, at Amazon. So on a, on a practical level, like who, if I was a PM at Amazon now, who would I be sharing this with? Would I share it with all my other product peers? Would I be sharing with all the engineering team or like who, like who, who would be the, some of the people who might read it. Yeah, I definitely think the UX lead on your team is an yeah. important uh, stakeholder. I definitely think pure PMs are truly my strength at Amazon. Uh, you know, regardless, like whether you are within my team, you own this product, regardless of your level, I really feel like there is so much richness in pure, uh, in your pure product network, especially if they are within your org. But I think it's really important, you know, to just get this in front of them and be like, you know, what am, what am I missing? What am I missing? Like, why is this yeah. not a good idea to put even one resource on? Is typically the uh, is the approach with with which we go for each experiment. You know, we are trying to disconfirm our belief, and if I can do that without, you know, using up some of my tech resources, I'd rather know now than later. So, my peer PMs. Perfect. And what is the what is the role of user research in in something like this? Would would you would you work with them alongside this as well to, to kind of create those hypotheses, or do they have like a separate role that's fed into the to the wider product uh, strategy or process? Yeah, I, I think there are, there are two uh, trains that our UX team takes. Right, the first one is like an all along uh, kind of research where you're just researching broader, more ambiguous topics. And then there is also the more like day-to-day, -day, like experiment by experiment contribution, which is, you know, once we come up with the customer problem and the hypothesis, we then sit with our UX team members to describe the solution and create the experience in terms of mocks. And we do this again, I, you know, both the PM and the UX will sit together. We'll you like, you know, try to figure out like, hey, should we do this? Should we not do that? Should we put this here? Should we put that there? So it's like a joint effort. And then we take it out to the to actual customers on like usertesting.com or something else and get okay. like really quick feedback. Again, like, you know, at Amazon, like the one thing at least I highly encourage is to look around the corners all the time. Like for the things that, you know, it, you know, specifically looking to disconfirm what you're doing is the right thing to do is a great way to be bulletproof when you get to the hypothesis. And so you will look, uh, you will find what you look for. And so, you know, don't look for exactly what you want uh, to be the situation. So, so we do that, we iterate on that. And then, you know, we bring it back to, we put it back in this document. And when it's the, the final version is what makes it into this document. Like, hey, we've got a bunch of research. We've taken the prototype. We learned some things, we changed some things. And now this is what we want to develop. Okay, perfect. And on a, on, a, on a really practical level, what mm -hmm. what tools would you use? I know you mentioned usertesting.com for, for research and usability testing. Are there any other tools that you use to, to both conduct tests and then also analyze the, the results of, a, of an experiment? Like software um, and things like that. Yeah, well, Amazon uses its own internal software for everything. But, you okay. know, we just 
Uh, so it's, it's very similar to, I think I've, I think I remember folks at like Expedia using TNL test and learn. It's been a while though, uh, since I, so I might be, I might be misremembering the exact name of the tech, but we have our own version of that, that we use within uh, Amazon. And th- it's basically just run of the mill, right? We construct something that is, that has a, that has an AB test ID attached to it. We determine the trigger point. We determine the traffic between control and treatment. And then we can dial up those percentages and dial it down. And then it's just a BA effort to actually determine the results of that T-test. Okay, cool. And and that's one of the major benefits of working at such a big company, isn't it, I guess, which is that you really do have the volumes to be able to conduct robust tests and, and be certain that the results are statistically significant. You know, in smaller businesses, it's not always possible to be certain that the results you're seeing are significant mm-hmm. enough to make a, a full on decision. So I guess at Amazon, you've yeah. got such this, the scale is so big, you can literally just turn on the tra- uh, traffic whenever you want. Yeah, but yes, uh, that is true. You know, we do have it easier when companies are bigger. However, I also think that, you know, the the one of the things that I love about the A-B test is honestly, it's the great equalizer. You know, if it it all depends on where you set the trigger, the trigger for your A-B test. Okay. So if you, uh, if you have, let's say, you know, like a favoriting function in some sort of like retail website, and if you you know, say that, you know, I'll construct my A-B test such that every time somebody logs in, you know, they will either see this favoriting function or they won't. It means that your trigger is so up the funnel that by the time somebody, you know, comes to your page and needs to favorite yeah. something, you've lost a bunch of qualifying traffic. Yeah. Instead, you know, if you uh, set the trigger at the point where, let's say, it's a, a customer instead lands on a page where favoriting function is available, you are much more likely to remove the noise. And where this leads you is not just a good A/B test, but it equalizes your a, your control and treatment bucket. And I say this because you know, as long as your the size of traffic on control and the size of traffic on treatment are equal you can find statistical significance it is when they are unequal or uh, you know like if you do 80 and 20 percent you know like 80 percent c control 20 percent c treatment now you've started forcefully you know removing data from your treatment and then it becomes really hard but you still in fact have a really good chart when your uh, just your two buckets are balanced in terms of traffic yeah, perfect. Yeah, that's uh, that's really interesting, actually. And I guess, I guess there's every product team at Amazon is almost competing to try to get their experiment live. Did, how do, how do you prioritize which experiments get pushed live, or are you free to just push any experiment live? Is, is there a prioritization process for the experiments that Amazon runs? I think you know those are the beauties of an A/B test. Again, I'm a big proponent. Honestly, is it really doesn't matter what is happening in the rest of the site like who's launching, like whether, you know, there are five A-B tests alive or there are a hundred, it really doesn't matter to your A-B test just because of the pure, the pure nature of an A-B test that keeps both sets random, right? And so because they're both random, uh, it is a perfect, it's in perfect synchrony. So the folks in control have seen the same combination buffet of other web labs or A-B tests that have been running versus your, so it nullifies all our impacts because they are random in nature. So I think that's what we love about it. (laughs) Perfect. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Awesome. Um, So I think, I think that's, uh, that, that covers your, your three areas of your, of your product stack. And Aside from the aside from the bits that you that you shared with us today, are there any you know other other products or tools that you use on a day to day basis? I think you know I really wish I had a, a cool answer for this one, but I just ha- I have a lot of sticky notes that okay. I keep. I've managed to keep organized, honestly, that I use a lot. I really couldn't do without them. But, you know, the one thing that I think has really helped me just like, you know, with growing responsibility, et cetera, you know, in, in teams and companies is, you know, when you think you have something to do, set an actual calendar invite in order to do it. I think that really just, you know, hones in on like, if I need to tell, if I tell somebody, hey, cool, I'll get back to you by end of week on this thing. I set an actual calendar invite on Thursday to do that thing and send it out. And so I found that that I know it's silly, but it really just helps me, you know, keep up my promises because we we make so many of them and that helps me stay organized. Apart from that, like 
you know, the things that I think really help as a, uh, as a product manager is, you know, just stay curious and, you know, just don't let that die. I know in our team, in our org, actually, you know, I'm usually the first one to say, oh, can, can we do this for book club? I run a book club. Oh, and, you know, the nice. things that are, that we that we read have actually nothing to do with product management and it's one of my favorite things to do is to just demystify like product management from being able to like you know like if there is this book in order to like figure it out or whatever it is you know i i really think uh, what we do and that's have been really useful for us is that we read like books from totally unconnected you know uh, studies for yeah. example like you know it could be economics it could be uh, human psychology it could you know I think I read a book about like dream analyzing so it can be totally random but then we yeah. come back as a group and we're like hey which of these things that you know we learned could be useful to us in our products or in the way that we think about things and you'll be surprised just how much there is of an overlap of things and I learned this from you know just moving from procurement to uh, to product management like we started this conversation I've actually found that you know regardless of what you might have been in the past you can always go into product management because there's always something you can take over and so with that I'd like to just recommend a couple of books I think Hook is a great one. Um, it's a pure product management book, but I think I I think it, it helped me understand like you know very early on like you know what are the hooks in a product and like how do you bring people back and it's an important one to keep in mind for the basics. And then I'm currently reading the Voltage Effect, which actually is a pretty cool book. It's about just like examples from running you know how things worked in like policy setting and you know. Uh, there are some examples with Uber. And so, you know, the author does a great job just talking about like these millions of different examples and like bite-sized chapters. And you'll be surprised just how much A-B testing that is in those. And it's pretty awesome. So if okay. uh, that's my current read. And then, you know, finally, I think, you know, once you start getting into this rut of doing these, like don't just use products, you know, like when you use, I don't know, like Splitwise or like Instagram or whatever it might be that you use, don't just use them like, you'll start to notice like, oh, why did they put this button here? Oh, yeah. that's a smart way to put this button there. And you'll start seeing through those things and you'll, you'll always learn something. So I think, you know, just changing that view has, is, is a really fun way to look at the world. Perfect. Yeah, that's, that's really, uh, really interesting. I really like the idea of, you know, laterally applying stuff, which doesn't seem related, but you can, yeah. if you force yourself to find that relationship some way, that's a really great way of, of thinking creatively about problem solving and, and, and that kind of thing. So thanks very much for, for sharing your, your unique perspectives with us. And thanks very much for sharing your, your product stacks with us. And if people want to kind of follow you, do you have like a, a LinkedIn or Twitter or anything like that where people could, could, could follow you? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn, Aishwarya Murli, product at Amazon. Perfect. Thanks very much for, for sharing your product stack with us. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much.